Hypoglycemics are used to treat high blood sugar, a condition commonly known as diabetes mellitus. As a quick review, type 1 diabetes mellitus, which most commonly affects children and adolescents, arises when certain cells of the pancreas, known as beta cells, are unable to produce enough insulin to maintain normal blood glucose levels. This is in contrast to type 2 diabetes mellitus, where the body is able to produce insulin, but the tissues don't respond as well to it, or in other words, these individuals are insulin resistant. Many hypoglycemics, like sulfonylureas, promote the release of insulin from the beta cells of the pancreas, and therefore are known as insulin secretagogues. In this video though, we'll be focusing specifically on the use of non-secretagogues in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. These medications consist of multiple classes of drugs with varying mechanisms of action. The classes include biguanides, thiazolidinediones, alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, amylin analogs, and sodium glucose transporter 2 agonists. It's important to note though that diet and exercise should always be the first step in managing diabetes before initiating medications, and should generally be continued while on medication as well. There are two classes of medications that increase insulin sensitivity and decrease the production of new glucose, and they include biguanides and thiazolidinediones. Let's start with the biguanides. Biguanides are the first line of therapy for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. There's one main drug in the biguanide class, and that's metformin. Its main mechanism of action is to decrease the production of new glucose from the liver, or to inhibit hepatic gluconeogenesis. Although the exact mechanism remains unknown, it's believed that metformin does this by increasing the activity of the liver enzyme known as AMP-dependent protein kinase, or AMPK. AMPK has many complex functions, namely it plays a role in insulin signaling, as well as helping to regulate the metabolism of glucose and lipids. Activated AMPK inhibits certain genes that promote gluconeogenesis like phosphoenolpyruvate carboxykinase and glucose 6-phosphatase. Thus, via AMPK activation, metformin results in the reduction of gluconeogenesis. In addition, activation of AMPK causes the glucose transporter protein GLUT4, stored within adipose and muscle tissue, to embed into the plasma membrane, allowing glucose to enter. Thus, metformin increases insulin sensitivity in these tissues and promotes peripheral glucose uptake, and this reduces the overall levels of glucose in the blood. A third mechanism of action of metformin is that it decreases the intestinal absorption of glucose, and again causes less glucose to enter the bloodstream. The most common side effects of metformin are gastrointestinal disturbances like diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal cramps. It's also associated with weight loss, and therefore metformin is particularly useful in overweight or obese diabetic patients. Although rare, one of the most well-known side effects of metformin is lactic acidosis. Typically, lactate is taken up by the liver and utilized in the process of hepatic gluconeogenesis. However, since metformin inhibits gluconeogenesis, the lactate builds up in the blood. In healthy individuals, this excess lactate usually does not become problematic, because the kidneys can excrete it in the urine. In patients with renal dysfunction, though, the kidneys are unable to clear the excess lactate and it can lead to acidosis. Thus, metformin is contraindicated in patients with renal impairment. The next group of medications is the thiazolidinediones, sometimes just referred to as glitazones. The two main drugs in this class are rosaglitazone and pioglitazone. Similar to the biguanides, thiazolidinediones are insulin sensitizers, meaning that they make peripheral tissues more sensitive to the insulin that the body has already produced. They work as agonists at a receptor known as the peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma, or PPAR gamma. Normally, this receptor is activated when ligands like free fatty acids bind to it after which it binds to DNA and another receptor known as the retinoid X receptor. This complex is then able to regulate the transcription of many insulin-responsive genes. In particular, it increases insulin sensitivity in adipose, liver, and skeletal muscle. The medications rosaglitazone and pioglitazone are synthetic ligands that can bind to the PPAR gamma receptors in the same way as the natural ligands. 
which leads to increased insulin sensitivity. In fact, these medications have been shown to increase insulin sensitivity or glucose uptake in peripheral tissues by 30 to 50 percent. Furthermore, the glitazones also increase the synthesis of proteins involved in lipid metabolism. The end result is a decrease in triglycerides, an increase in both high-density lipoprotein, or HDL, and low-density lipoprotein, or LDL. LDL is sometimes called bad cholesterol because it can lead to atherosclerosis, or plaque buildup in the blood vessels, which can ultimately lead to weight gain and cardiovascular disease. In terms of side effects, rosaglitazone in particular has been shown to increase the risk of certain cardiovascular events like myocardial infarction and stroke, likely due to the increased synthesis of LDL. Rosaglitazone also causes increased fluid retention, or edema, which might further exacerbate symptoms in patients with heart failure. Studies have shown that pioglitazone might increase the risk of bladder cancer. Both medications may increase the risk of osteopenia and fractures. There's also some concern that these medications might increase the risk of hepatitis and liver failure. And therefore, liver enzymes must be monitored closely, particularly during the first few months of initiating therapy. Now, the next two classes of medications, the alpha-glucosidase inhibitors and amylin analogs, act directly on the GI tract by delaying the breakdown of food and its excretion from the body. Let's look at the alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, which includes the medications acarbose and miglitol. Alpha-glucosidase is an enzyme that's found in the brush border of the intestines, and it breaks down the complex carbohydrates, like starch, into their simpler monosaccharide units, like glucose, which is eventually absorbed through the lining of the intestine and into the blood. Alpha-glucosidase inhibitors prevent this process and therefore they delay the breakdown of carbohydrates, like starch and disaccharides. This ultimately lowers postprandial, or post-meal, glucose levels. However, the undigested carbohydrates remain within the colon and are digested by intestinal bacteria, leading to gastrointestinal disturbances like gas, bloating, and diarrhea, which are the main side effects associated with this class of drug. Now that we've talked about alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, Let's now move on to a minor class of drugs known as the synthetic amylin analogs, which includes the medication pramlintide. Amylin is a hormone that's secreted alongside insulin from the beta cells of the pancreas. Amylin and its synthetic analog, pramlintide, lower blood glucose by delaying gastric emptying, inhibiting glucagon secretion, and improving satiety or the feeling of fullness. Unlike the other drugs discussed so far, Pramlintide is an injectable medication, not an oral one. Also, unlike the other drugs discussed, pramlintide can be used in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Side effects associated with pramlintide include nausea and an increased risk of hypoglycemia when used with insulin. The last group of miscellaneous medications we'll discuss are the SGLT2 inhibitors. In the kidney, there's a transporter known as the sodium glucose-like transporter 2 or SGLT2, and it accounts for 90% of all renal glucose absorption. When this transporter is inhibited by SGLT2 inhibitors like canagliflozin and dapagliflozin, the kidney is unable to reabsorb glucose. Instead, it causes glycosuria and the glucose is excreted out into the urine. The SGLT2 inhibitors have been known to cause various genital infections like vulvovaginal candidiasis and urinary tract infections. Now, we want to make a simple and fun mnemonic that'll help you efficiently memorize and retain all these farm facts. So let's set the scene in an apartment. Someone is shouting insults outside, which represents insulin. So the drugs that increase insulin sensitivity will go right by the window. Next, we have a dining table in the middle of the room, and this is where we'll put the drugs that act in the GI tract. Finally, there's a urinal on one side of the wall where we'll put the drugs that increase renal glucose excretion. By the window, we have the foreman of the construction site for metformin. He's standing in front of a guitar amp with the letter K on it to help you remember it activates AMPK. Behind him is a bushel of sugar canes to help you remember it also inhibits gluconeogenesis, as well as increases insulin sensitivity. The foreman lost a lot of weight recently, as can be seen by his loose slacks, representing weight loss. He's drinking spoiled, acidic milk for lactic acidosis, and he's vomiting, representing the GI symptoms. Next, we have two people dressed as calzones by the window. 
One's holding a pi for pioglitazone, and the other's holding a rose for rosaglitazone. They're standing on top of a newspaper, since they're agonists of PPAR gamma receptors. Now both of these guys are pretty chubby, from all the calzones they've been eating, representing weight gain from increased LDL. Rosaglitazone is also holding a heart-shaped box of chocolates with a knife stabbed into it, to help you remember it increases the risk of myocardial infarction. Water is leaking out of the box for fluid retention and edema. For pioglitazone, his pie has a crab claw sticking out of it, and it's holding a little bladder. Remember cancer is a crab in astrology, so this will help you remember it increases the risk of bladder cancer. Between the two calzone fans, we have a liver with fractured bones sticking out of it, to represent hepatotoxicity and bone fractures. Alright, so let's move on to the dining table for the drugs that decrease GI absorption of glucose. First, there's a model of a train caboose for A. carbos, and a model of a Russian MIG jet for Miglitol. These drugs prevent the breakdown of complex carbohydrates, so we can put a big intact sugar cube between them. Since they cause gas and bloating as side effects, we can put a gas barrel that's about to burst right on top of the sugar cube. Next, we have a pram by the dining table for pramlintide. The pram is full of baby food for delayed gastric emptying, but the baby's gone, representing the inhibition of glucagon. The baby might have been scared away since the drug is given via injection, as represented by a large needle in the pram. The numbers 1 and 2 are on the side of the pram since it's effective for type 1 and type 2 diabetes. The baby also left some empty candy wrappers on the ground, representing hypoglycemia as the side effect. Alright, the last class of drugs are represented by the urinal, since they increase urine excretion of glucose. These drugs include canagliflozin and dapagliflozin, so they'll be represented by a griffin. To help you remember that they inhibit SGLT2, a sign in front of him says Sergeant Lieutenant Griffin. Since infections of the genitourinary tract is the main side effect, let's put a sugar cube in the urinal which is attracting a lot of bacteria. Alright, as a quick recap. Miscellaneous hypoglycemics are medications used to treat type 2 diabetes. Biguanides, mainly metformin, decrease hepatic glucose production of glucose and increase insulin sensitivity. It's the first line choice for pharmaceutical therapy to treat type 2 diabetes. Thiazolidine dienes consist of pioglitazone and rosaglitazone, and bind to the PPAR gamma receptors to increase sensitivity to insulin. Alpha-glucosidase inhibitors include acarbose and miglitol, and delay carbohydrate metabolism. Amylin analogs like pramlintide delay gastric emptying. Finally, SGLT2 inhibitors increase the urinary excretion of glucose. But wait, there's more. Here's a mind map with all the mnemonics. Go ahead and pause the video so you can test yourself to see what you remember, and stay tuned for the answers after the credits.